Your own?
Hi there, we're going to be starting in one minute, so those of you who are still mingling upstairs, find a seat. Hi there, my name's Gary Annable, and I'm, the pro I'm a project manager at the George and Fei Yi Center for Healthcare Innovation, or CHI for short. And it's been a highlight of my career to be part of the team that's developed this project over the past two and a half years. Uh, this forum is generously organized as part of CHI's Grand Round series, so thanks to all the CHI staff who are helping out here today and in the planning. I'd like to acknowledge that this event is being held on the original lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we're dedicated to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Almost 200 people registered in advance today, including members of the public, patients, healthcare providers, health system managers, researchers, and students. The room is filling up here, and there are other people in and outside of Winnipeg participating via streaming YouTube video. During the first hour, you'll hear presentations about the overall vision of mindset and the major components of the project. That will be followed by the first of two 15-minute periods for you to ask questions of the presenters. Then there'll be a panel discussion with representatives of Mindset's main knowledge user communities, patients, clinicians, health system decision makers, scientists, and industry. That panel will be followed by another question and answer period. For those of you watching on YouTube, you'll be able to submit questions from the web and by text using an app called Poll Everywhere. Those of you in the theater are also welcome to use Poll Everywhere as well. The directions that are on the screen here will also be shown during the question and answer sessions. And they're also printed on your program. On the web, go to pollev.com, enter CHIMB622, and submit your question. On your phone, send a text to 37607 with CHIMB622 in the message. That will connect you to the poll everywhere and allow you to submit your questions. Text questions are list limited to 160 characters, so be brief. Anything after 160 will be truncated. You can send your questions at any time during the forum, and our volunteers will collate them for the two question and answer sessions. The slide deck from today and the video will be available on CHI's website in a few days. It's now my honor to introduce Dr. Peter Nickerson, the Vice Dean Research for the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. Thanks very much, uh, Gary. Well, welcome to the University of Manitoba. I'm delighted to be here this morning on behalf of Dr. Brian Postel, uh, Dean, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences, and Vice Provost uh, Health Sciences. University of Manitoba is one of 15 research-intensive universities in Canada. Our researchers garner more than $210 million of research funding every year and are at the cutting edge of discoveries and scholarly works in many different areas, including population health, infectious disease, global public health, indigenous health, climate change, and human rights, and more. Uh, today's Mindset Forum is an example of the importance of collaboration and partnership between government, community, clinician scientists, researchers, care providers, and organizations. And I want to sincerely thank and acknowledge the Canada Institutes for Health Research and Manitoba Health Seniors and Active Living for their invaluable support in this project, of which you'll hear more about later at the funding announcement at 1230 in the Brody Centre uh, in the atrium. So I'd encourage you all to come there as well. Uh, and looking around the room today, you will see the University of Manitoba researchers and graduate students, provincial and federal government representatives, hospital staffs, members of health and social service agencies, patients, and other members of the public. You'll hear more about the overall Mindset project this morning, and you'll hear from a truly diverse set of stakeholders and partners, including three University of Manitoba clinician scientists, 
based in the George and Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation, Cancer Care Manitoba, and the Seven Oaks Hospital Chronic Disease Innovation Center, who are leading the Mindset project. You're in for an illuminating morning. In closing, I just want to congratulate the team members of the Mindset project um, and the uh, George and Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation, Shared Health, and all the partners for bringing people together for this morning's Mindset Forum and what promises to be an important, stimulating discussion about Manitoba's new transformative, integrative health data platform. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Brock Wright, CEO of Shared Health and the Provincial Lead of Health Services in Manitoba, who will be moderating the forum this morning. Brock. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, and a uh, very warm uh, good morning and welcome to everybody who's in the room today and everybody who's online. I'd like to spend a few minutes and just put this uh, forum into context for you. Uh, in healthcare today in Manitoba, the most significant transformative change is really that for the first time, major healthcare organizations such as the regional health authorities, Cancer Care Manitoba, AFM, and others are working together with the new provincial health authority, Shared Health, to jointly plan clinical and preventive services, jointly establish provincial clinical policies, guidelines, and protocols, and support each other in the day-to-day -day delivery of health services. And this has never happened before, and we believe it will lead to better integrated and coordinated provincial health system service delivery. Uh, just this past year, hundreds, literally hundreds, of clinicians from across Manitoba came together with input from numerous municipal leaders, indigenous groups, French language groups, the university, and many, many others to develop Manitoba's first five-year clinical and preventive services plan. The plan was approved by government and was released publicly, and we are now working together across the province to implement the plan. We're building a provincial clinical network where all parts of the system will row together with streamlined provincial care pathways and processes that better support providers and who can then in turn better support patients and clients. Uh, this provincial clinical network will address real priorities such as the inequities in care that exist for Indigenous peoples and the growing demand for mental health and addiction services. It will shift care closer to home from institutions to the community and from Winnipeg to rural and northern Manitoba. It will introduce new collaborative care models that better utilize healthcare providers expanding scopes of practice and it will introduce new digital technologies and care processes to expand virtual care. However, all of this will require better access to real-time data and analysis and a closer collaboration with health researchers. Like the health system itself, our data systems have been quite siloed and difficult to access. We have over 2,000 applications in Manitoba that include major data systems such as EDIS and ATD, and LIS and RIS and DEEPEN and others. Some of the data from these applications can be viewed in systems such as eChart, but what has been lacking is what you will hear today referred to as an integrated provincial data platform, where data from these siloed applications can be downloaded in closer to real time so that they can be more easily accessed and analyzed to support many needs, such as health system planning, service delivery, quality improvement, system performance, and to support clinical and health systems research. The integrated provincial data platform will be established and supported in a part of Manitoba Health called Provincial Information Management and Analytics, or PIMA for short. And that is what we will discuss today, is how we are going to begin to build this platform and how we are going to begin to apply it. Mindset stands for Manitoba's Integrated Data Set, and it's funded, as you've heard, by CIHR and the Manitoba government. It's led by uh, Dr. Ryan Zerchansky uh, with co-PIs Dr. Marshall uh, Pitts and Paul Kamanda, and includes key partners such as Pima in Manitoba Health, Digital Health and Shared Health, Cancer Care Manitoba, CHI and MCHP in the university, but most importantly, uh, it, it, it's a partnership that includes patients. As you will hear, Digital Health, working with Pima, will begin to build this integrated provincial data platform, and they will start by incorporating certain data sets that are needed to support three discrete research projects that you'll hear about today. The system efficiencies that accrue from these three research projects will then be reinvested to support new projects that will require data from other applications to be added to the platform. And that is how the integrated data platform will expand over time. 
So uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of context for the discussion today. Starting us off will be Dr. Uh, Ryan Zerchansky, right there. Uh, Ryan is a hematologist, a critical care physician, and a clinician scientist. He's a graduate of this university and an associate professor in the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences Center, uh, Health Sciences Department of Internal Medicine. He is a hematologist at Cancer Care Manitoba and a senior scientist at the Research Institute of Oncology and Hematology. He has advanced training in epidemiology and the design and conduct of multicenter randomized trials. And he's the nominated principal investigator of the Mindset Project. Ryan? Okay, thank you very much, Brock. It's incredible uh, to be here after what we thought was a fairly long journey to get here. But part of the spoiler is that you're just at the beginning. And so we have come together to really launch an idea and an operational plan to set an idea in motion. But we are all at the beginning. As stakeholders of the healthcare system, we have an opportunity to shape a vision to, and uh, to create a, a, a new way that we interact with the healthcare system and use healthcare data. Thank you to all the partners who've uh, contributed to get us here to this far. There are many, and we'll come back to some of the individual con contributions. Okay, these are my disclosures, uh, mostly grant funding. I'm grateful to the, the support I received from Cancer Care Manitoba, from the Department of Medicine, from the Lionel G. Israel's professorship that allows this, these kind of ideas to incubate and take shape on a daily basis. How we currently use health data. So we currently have a huge amount of clinical data in Manitoba. Contrary to the well-organized and well-curated administrative data within uh, MCHP, Manitoba Health Center for Policy, um, our clinical data is very fractured, siloed. We bring it together on a per-project basis where we take this database, connect it to that database, and connect it to this one to understand who's an eMERGE or what surgery wait time lists are, are, are relevant today, or maybe connecting these ones to understand who gets a massive transfusion for a project that we had completed earlier. But everything is done kind of on a per-project basis. We have some standing connections for sure, but it's certainly not an efficient way to use our health data in front of us. We know that data is really important to health decision making on a on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that clinical trials, the way we generate new knowledge is super expensive, and we need more efficient ways to bring those costs down so we can bring new data, bring new knowledge to the fore, and make uh, uh, clinical decisions uh, more rapidly. We know that we can use these data for different purposes, but it's hard right now in the siloed context of the clinical data sets. But we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity in Manitoba for change. In the context of a healthcare transformation that's going on around us, we can transform the way we use data every day. We have a provincial information management and analytic uh, strategy or a, a mandate to, to, to do this at a provincial government level. It's that's further created an opportunity um, for us to partner and make this vision a reality. We. Um, we have a government in place that is supportive of healthcare, but supportive of value-based healthcare as well, and want to see the value for the changes we make, so that our investments um, are uh, bring about um, positive change, and uh, and um, and we can understand that return on investment for the substantial healthcare investment we make every day. We have abundance of high fidelity clinical data. We have immense immense amount of expertise in IT within our province. We, all the stars are aligned with regard to mandates, expertise, available data, a need for change to create such a change in Manitoba today. So how can we do things differently? So today we're going to talk about creating a successful mindset for change within Manitoba. Essentially, our, the larger vision, and I'm not the IT expert, so the larger vision is to, is to thematically uh, group our databases, understand um, the data that's the contained within them, and to extract that data, transform it into a, a repository, a cloud-based repository, where then we can then pull the data out for a different context that is very specific for the need, for the person, or for the application. For instance, if you're a health researcher wanting to do an innovative clinical trial, you might use individual data um, 
from certain data sets to, uh, to identify a patient who's eligible for a clinical trial, to follow them through a clinical trial, and to report on the results. If you're a practitioner, you might need higher fidelity data to understand who scheduled where, what was the results of that MRI, and when is the, when is the next test due, and, and, um, and, and how, how those appointments need to fall into place to meet, meet a certain clinical benchmark. If you're a healthcare administrator, you might need aggregate data at a systems level to understand who's where, what resources are being consumed, what capacity do we have, and what is the return on investment for, um, in, in a certain domain. So you can see that there's different ways to, to combine data, different ways to output data, and different ways to protect data, depending on who you are, why you're using it. And this is, this is really what mindset is about. It's about understanding the, the data we have, bringing it into a central repository and exporting it based on need and user function. What are the benefits of such an integrated health data platform? Well, there are many. As I said, we have, we have, we have a mass great benefit from integrating administrative data, but it, that is the harder data to use on a day-to-day -day basis. But we can, we can drive sustainability if we can make, generate knowledge and make decisions that are value-based, create efficiency with our healthcare system, we can promote the sustainability of our health system in general. And we'll show you in, in demonstration how we plan to do that in the three embedded trials. We can create a learning health system by this. We amass data every day. Every single patient encounter creates data, but we, do, we don't really incorporate that into day-to-day decision-making. Instead, what our region has done not, not fault of its own, but the way, way this has developed is that research was over here, clinical practice was over here, and they're separated. Even though we're a teaching hospital, the process is very separate. And what we want to do is bring those processes together so we create a learning health system. So every p inpatient encounter informs the next one. So every, every experience, every, every bit of knowledge that can be created by a clinic visit or a patient on trial can bring, can bring that knowledge quicker to, uh, to practice the next time so we can r reduce that cycle that it takes from a hypothesis to a practice change or a systems change. We can reduce inequalities in care by improving access to, to uh, um, an integrated health system for patients and, per and for providers. We can, we can um, expand the access of, 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 uh, to health care um, in general in our, in our province but also start to measure and understand the inequalities in different populations, um, rural, urban, indigenous, non-indigenous. And I think that's a really powerful tool that we'll speak more about. And so there's multiple uh, components um, and, and, and improvements we can make by integrating um, health data. And here are some of them on the screen. If we were to do this at a provincial level, which we plan to do, it would be immensely expensive and the, and the value of connecting every database at the beginning would not be apparent. It, it would not be apparent to funders. It would be prohibitively expensive to organize from the beginning. And it wouldn't be cost efficient because uh, we wouldn't know exactly where to tailor the investment. And so what we plan to do and how we want to la launch Mindset is we've embedded three demonstration projects that use integrated real-time, near real-time or real-time integrated health data three different ways in three different priority settings in Manitoba Health, in, in different populations with different outcomes to achieve similar results. One, to improve health outcomes for patients, improve quality of life, and reduce cost to the healthcare system. And so we're gonna talk about three of these projects um, coming up. One in dialysis, um, and a home assisted dialysis led by Paul Comenda um, and team. One in cancer navigation, um, led by Marshall Peets, and one in hematology and transfusion medicine, um, led by Brett Houston uh, and myself and others, uh, where we're going to be reducing um, the amount of blood uh, transfused to people undergoing major surgery. Each of these um, embedded projects use, as I said, use data different ways, different ways but what, what we all show is that we're tackling Manitoba priorities using integrated data. Um, these, are, these are needs identified that we, we, that we need structures in place to study that couldn't have been done, really, without integrated health data. Um, we will show that we can reduce costs while improving outcomes. 
this is a huge project, um, but it's feasible. We have the data sets that in existence already. We're leveraging things that, and concepts, data that is already present within the province of Manitoba. The next step would be to uh, Im improve upon the data we have by embedding patient reported outcomes or, or, or other important data into the healthcare system. We have a really strong accomplished team, but incredible partnerships um, from government, uh, within government, um, within our health region, patients, large institutes within Manitoba to make this happen. These diverse partnerships have really led us to this point today. Without the engagements of the, the health region, cancer care in Manitoba, the university, industry, we could not have gotten this far, and this is what's going to create our success going forward, we think. Our scalability plan is, um, is articulated in this slide here. We're going to be using a phased use um, case uh, project uh, framework that is really drives expansion by the value we create in the system of mindset. Sure, we're tackling issues in nephrology, cancer, and hematology now, but in, a, in phase two and phase three, we're gonna expand the use of mindset integrated data to show how we can drive, uh, drive better decision-making, improve value in the healthcare system and primary care and mental health. We think there's an opportunity to, um, to, to, to call upon um, the, the mandate uh, given to us in uh, the truth, truth and Reconciliation principles and call to action by embedding, working with Ngamazin and, uh, and, and, and uh, Indigenous researchers to in incorporate eventually race, ethnicity, indigeneity into, our, into mindset that will then allow us to um, be the first province in Canada to, uh, to really allow reporting of, um, of measures um, with regard to health inequities, health index um, amongst Indigenous and non-Indigenous populations. This is an opportunity that would not, does not exist in other provinces, and we can show that we can answer that call at a provincial level using integrated data. The idea is to um, expand the clinical uh, data platform over time, um, again, with, with, uh, with these case use examples that are value driven, that tackle Manitoba priorities, uh, that can be further cultivated by external investment that we'll talk to. Sh sure, there's challenges. There's no question there'll be challenges doing this. Governance, ownership of data, how, how, um, how this is combined safely, uh, respecting issues of privacy, are, 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 are absolute um, um, uh, key issues on our mind that we have come together to solve um, um, together. Who, who will access it safely? Um, under what, what, uh, what, for what purpose? Um, will patients access the data? How will they access the data? Will, provi will help providers, system uh, administrators? How will they access it? Under what safe condition? All, all challenges that we're working through, but we have an operational plan um, that we're rolling out. This is a system created that is going to benefit our healthcare, um, our, our, our global healthcare system that is meant to serve patients. And, and patients have been included in all aspects of this from the beginning. They're not just included, they're partners. And so how, what, what will this system look like? What will be the access point? How will privacy be protected? How will we use this for research, for clinical delivery, um, for understanding um, value-based decisions? And there's multiple examples that are shown on the screen uh, how patients have partnered in this capacity. Multiple partnerships exist to make this happen. Um, CHR uh, um, provided initial um, in-cash support, as did Manitoba Health Seniors and Active Living. Substantial in-kind support, though, and has been provided by many partners um, that will eventually fill several screens. Some of the key ones are listed on, on, this, on the slides here today. Shared health, a major contributor, digital health to, this, to the development of this platform and its eventual success. Cancer Care Manitoba, Biosciences Manitoba, um, Research Manitoba, all, all, all of them really key partners to get us um, here, here today. So we have an opportunity to transform the way we use data in Manitoba at a provincial level. 
we can use this integrated health care uh, health platform to address Manitoba priorities to le by leveraging existing data sets that will generate new knowledge in a, in a fashion that's scalable, that's feasible, that will reduce inequalities of access and care in Manitoba over time, focusing on value-based uh, decision-making in a context whereby patients are engaged from the beginning, so it's made by patients for patients at the end. We're not creating another data platform here. We're not creating a super database of all, of all your health uh, information within Manitoba. We're creating a mindset. We're creating a transformative vision for how we use healthcare data in Manitoba. Period. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the vision, and that's some of the early steps we've taken. Um, I don't have a lot of technical expertise with regard to combining data, um, perhaps in organizing it around a clinical trial, but Dr. Marshall Peets, Doug Snell are more of the IT experts. Marshall is our IT lead in the Mindset platform, and he's working with, uh, with uh, Doug Snell, um, who's the executive director of architecture at Digital Health, Together, they are putting this vision into place. They, they are creating the, the platform that will uh, promote, um, that will achieve their, our goals and promote the sustainability of our healthcare system. So, Marshall, tell us about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ryan. I should clarify, make no claims of, uh, about any technical expertise, um, but certainly I uh, have been interested in this topic for a long time and uh, feel very privileged to be working with uh, digital health and having. Uh, their uh, direct engagement, and so thank you for speaking today as well, Doug. I'll, uh, he's got a few slides coming up. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, as you see there, uh, mostly grant support um, uh, and, uh, and research support, and Doug's. Marshall? Yes. Yes. Is that better? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so this slide uh, is really just meant to uh, provide some discussion points around uh, health data and provide a, a little bit more context for you as to how uh, things are currently organized, how they have been historically, and what some of the differences are in uh, what we are uh, going to be achieving. So. Um, I guess the maps that you see uh, are obviously the province and the city of Winnipeg. All the black dots uh, are health centers uh, that provide care, draw labs, et cetera, in the province. Um, and, uh, and the colors that you see are, are uh, various regions uh, and communities. Um, and the reason that I highlight that um, it will be more clear in a second. Um, but just to start off, uh, I think um, what you've heard is that uh, there is a wealth of data in Manitoba um, and uh, as it relates to health um, of the population, of individuals, uh, and of the health system. Um, and we've for a long time <clears throat> been able to connect administrative data sets uh, to many other data sets, in fact, through the Center of Health Policy. Um, and that includes uh, things like uh, billing and costs um, so prescription, uh, you know, through the DPIN network, uh, so prescription fills and that sort of information um, has been extremely valuable for decades now. Um, the, uh, the additional, I guess, benefit that we have now that's come with uh, the technological advances over the last decade or so uh, in Manitoba and, uh, and uh, as you've heard, the, uh, the changes uh, provincially with respect to the value of these data is really what I think the opportunity we're trying to uh, impress upon you today. So clinical data is really that, is really that gap uh, that we've seen. Um, and, uh, and the clinical aspects are uh, really critical. So by clinical, I mean uh, you know, things like uh, test results, obviously, uh, being very important, diagnoses, um, uh, the actual interactions with the health system, um, and I think maybe what's more important uh, is realizing that these data are actually available uh, in real time or near real time as they happen 
uh, and that uh, provides substantial advantages for some of the projects that you'll see um, and some of the potential use cases for Mindset. Um, the, the, so that's one advantage. Um, the, the other advantages uh, and, and opportunities that we're seeing uh, that we want to leverage are around the organization and storage of the data. So um, right now uh, and historically, data have been uh, collected manually often, have been uh, curated for reporting to health, um, and would then filter into administrative data sets uh, for use for secondary use, uh, such as research. Uh, or planning and that sort of that sort of thing, um, and that uh, that has started to shift. That's still uh, what's done largely, um, but with the introduction of electronic systems that then capture this uh, as these events occur, or in at least closer to the time they occur, um, and these uh, data sets being uh, rolled out in a systematic manner uh, by eHealth at the time and digital health for capturing things like admission and discharge information and lab information. Um, that has really provided, uh, provided a more centralized uh, approach. So although the data are still governed by the health system where they reside, uh, the, um, the actual data um, and potentially then the availability of those data are now more centralized. Um, and you've heard how we use that for some things already like eChart, which is a way for providers of care to access data from across the province um, and uh, on an individual level. And so that's one example of how these data can be used. Uh, can be used. When we dig a little bit further, um, the data that's regional um, or provincial um, is also lacking certain groups. And one major group, of course, is uh, primary care. And a lot of data are stored in primary care EMRs or even specialty EMRs. Um, electronic medical records, and those data uh, provide, um, provide a, a substantial opportunity that we're hoping to leverage in future phases. Um, there have been major advances in the thinking around the governance of data, and uh, as has been mentioned before, the, there's a, a provincial information management and analytics working group that's starting to tackle some of these issues. Uh, there's been a recent review of provincial health legislation on privacy uh, through FIA. And so uh, these are major advances that have not been available previously. We're also um, much more keenly aware of how data needs to be secured uh, and have, uh, have a lot more expertise in the province around how to provide access uh, as, as required for certain, uh, for certain use cases and secure it appropriately. And that really uh, provides a big advantage. So uh, this is a slide you've seen, uh, but just to just to spend a couple of minutes uh, outlining some of the some of these uh, uh, data sets for you. Um, so um, so diagnostic data is probably one of the uh, biggest uh, data sets that we have in Manitoba. Been con it's been connected to an individual and linkable to other data sets for decades through the through the provincial um, provider. Um, uh, number, uh, FIN, sorry, uh, personal health information number, for almost everyone in the province. Um, and so the ability for us to take what is uh, uh, a number of individual data sets for, say, uh, someone's chemistry results or uh, blood count results um, or pathology results or radiology results, um, all housed in separate systems, sometimes multiple systems across the province, uh, but being able to, uh, to organize them in a way that if we need all of the radiology scheduling information, we know where it's found, we know how to access it, we know what it looks like, what the structure is. And so if we're going to be pulling that into a system that then requires it to be output in a certain way, we can build it in that way to facilitate whatever you need. And so I will speak more about that. Uh, for example, with uh, the CAPTAIN project as one demonstration project. And you can see, uh, maybe a little bit hard to, hard to see there, but there are many uh, examples of this through um, uh, you know, emergency department uh, access, primary care that I've mentioned, uh, the Cancer Care Manitoba databases, um, surgical information management system, so all of the details around what uh, procedures are happening when in the province. These are all data sets that are uh, individualized um, at the moment, but have the ability to be uh, harmonized and uh, used uh, in, in, uh, um, in, a, in a larger way. 
And so th those are examples uh, of how uh, this could work. Um, and so for a particular purpose, we will be using data from these, uh, from these uh, data sets that exist currently um, for the projects as, as we're going to be talking about right away. And so with that, I'd like to ask Doug uh, to say a few words, to come and say a few words from uh, Digital Health. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Marshall, and, and um, uh, thanks everyone. This is a, a tremendous opportunity. I, I can't, uh, I, I know we don't feel it right now, but uh, it's, it's been a privilege to be uh, invited here and to work with the, uh, with the PIs on this project. Uh, they have a tremendous vision. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's quite laudable. Uh, I'm excited. They're, they're very uh, visionary. They're, uh, they're full of enthusiasm, and, and it's a privilege to play some small part on the IT side. You can tell the IT guy needed to have a handler, so uh, <laughs> they, don't, they don't normally let me on my loose. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, touch on a point that uh, Dr., uh, uh, Dr. Wright had mentioned. Uh, he had mentioned uh, the number of systems we have in the province. So it might not be known to uh, many people in the audience or more broadly, but it certainly is to the PIs. Uh, you see the slide that's up on, on the uh, uh, up on the screen right now. It's representative of really the, the, the amount of information we have, the, the types of systems. And you heard Marshall uh, talk about a few of them, but we have 2,000 applications which uh, we required largely as point of service systems, whether administrative, clinical, uh, or otherwise, to manage uh, the provincial health system. And with changes that we've had uh, recently uh, to uh, the structure of the provincial health uh, system, some of the transformational initiatives, it's opened up a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, extract value out of information that we've been collecting for decades, uh, but have never assembled or related in a way that we could uh, extend the value of. There's, there's information inside these data sets uh, that will solve problems that we haven't even contemplated yet once we're able to aggregate it and take a step back and look, and, and that's what the work uh, these, uh, these folks are doing right now. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out here is, is just the velocity of change. So right now, we have a significant amount of, of data that's, uh, that's uh, inside of transactional systems in the health, uh, in the health uh, environment across the province. Uh, we're at just the precipice of, uh, of being able to unlock that value. So you see the slide that, that kind of indicates the velocity. So one of the things that I have to uh, plan forward is all of the aggregation of data that we're uh, adding into these data sets. Uh, we are accumulating uh, clinical data at 48% growth annually. And we're also accumulating clinical data at 10 times uh, the velocity that we are non-clinical data. So there is a tremendous amount of information available. We just need to be able to uh, capture it in a way and expose it to, uh, to folks like uh, uh, that are to my left to be able to uh, get value out of it. And uh, I don't think that we yet have determined the currency of that information in our environment. Uh, the next one was really just, uh, you know, to illustrate the partnerships that we have. So, uh, as Marshall and others had pointed out, uh, we're able now to work in ways that we haven't been able to work in the past, uh, and we'll continue to evolve these partnerships as they move forward uh, to better uh, provide services and capabilities uh, uh, to the health system for research, for primary use, secondary use, um, with the expectations of the, the legacy uh, model that organizations have had in the past uh, is going to get challenged. Uh, you can see by the green circle there uh, that's surrounding uh, those exponential growths. Those are the expectations uh, that, uh, that the system has, uh, and not just Manitoba, but, but just the practice in general uh, to uh, address the needs in terms of the agility that's required by, by folks like the PIs in order to meet the needs and the demands and the opportunities that exist. So we will be, uh, the point of that slide is really to indicate that new partnerships are going to fo uh, form, the pace of change uh, and the activities that are underway right now. Uh, we will never deliver m uh, l uh, any less or more slowly than we are right now. Uh, and uh, lastly, I think just to kind of hit on a point that, that Marshall had mentioned as well, um, and Ryan, is we haven't contemplated what adaptive governance is required in order to uh, expose these services, enable projects like this, uh, and to the point where the governance will need to adapt to shifting from vertical project and waterfall uh, to a continuous practice in the organization across the province. 
So, I, I mean, for me, if, if I was to take anything uh, off this, uh, you know, away from this presentation, it would be uh, Manitoba's in a very unique position across the country to be able to support initiatives like this, uh, to extract value inf information, and, and the other is, as, as Ryan had, uh, uh, and Marshall had pointed out, we have some assets like eChart Manitoba uh, that have population health information that we've, we've been collecting for over a decade, uh, but don't use it for uh, purposes uh, as described here, then we, we have opportunities to use that data uh, for, uh, for, for other purposes that could better uh, projects and, and move projects along like these. So thanks very much, Marshall, and, and it's been a privilege to be able to uh, participate. So thank you very much, uh, Ryan, Marshall, and uh, Doug. Uh, hopefully now you have a, a bit of a better sense around uh, what is an integrated provincial data platform and uh, what, why is it important and, and a little bit of a glimpse into its potential. And I think what the speakers also highlighted was the important role that partnerships play. It's really by coming together that we can pull this off and achieve this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hear briefly about the three trials uh, that will use the Mindset platform. And this is really a critical part because it's these three trials that will really drive what data is first introduced into the integrated data platform. It'll, be the, it'll, it'll drive the initial build, which will later be expanded upon. So we're going we're gonna to start with uh, Dr. Paul Comenda, who is a nephrologist, uh, a research director for the Chronic Disease Innovation Center and Mindset's Health Economics Lead, and uh, he will be presenting the Home First trial that demonstrates the value of assisted home dialysis to patients and the health system generally. He'll be followed by Dr. Marshall Pitts, who you've already heard from, who will show us how integrated clinical data can be used to assist uh, patients uh, with cancer to navigate the health system, uh, to improve the quality of their life, and also improve the efficiency of the healthcare system. Uh, and then you'll hear from Dr. Brett Houston, a hematologist, uh, who is completing her PhD with, uh, uh, with Ryan. And she will show us how Mindset's data can be used to conduct uh, innovative clinical trials much more quickly and to test new therapies at a fraction of the cost of, of uh, the way it's done now. So uh, in, in, ask uh, Paul to come to the stage and then followed by Marshall and Brett. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm not a scoliosis guy, but I'll have to hunch over a little bit. I'm the tallest member on the team. Um, so, so again, this is all very theoretical right now. It sounds kind of exciting, but we're, we need to kind of sink our teeth into some projects. And I think um, what you'll see, the projects that were selected are all quite diverse in terms of their partnerships, in terms of the health sector they touch, but also in terms of their approach to, I think the, the initial intent of the CIHR grant was to, to drive value for the system, which I think is a, is a key theme in, uh, in most of our uh, uh, discussions around transformation currently. Uh, again, I'm Paul Comenda. I've, uh, the main disclosure I have is I am chief medical officer of a dialysis device company that's pre-commercial in the UK. Uh, that's been the last year or so, but I've uh, been a home dialysis zealot or evangelist my entire life, so that doesn't uh, uh, play into anything we're going to talk about today. Um, the, 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 I'm the health economics lead, and I think really dialysis is something, if you're not aware of, it's life-sustaining therapy. In Manitoba, we lead the nation in kidney failure and dialysis rates, if not the world, in terms of our, the epidemiology disease here. More sobering is a dialysis patient, even within the city of Winnipeg, costs about sixty dollars to $80,000 per year, and that's really consistent across multiple costing studies. So, so we, we spend a ton of money on patients uh, receiving life-sustaining dialysis. For that, we get back patients who suffer from often very poor health-related quality of life and really uh, dire health outcomes. Um, the chances of dying on, when patients are in dialysis is about 50% at five years, which is worse than most metastatic cancers, and a lot of people aren't aware of that sobering statistic. When we look at the geography of Manitoba, the, the growth in dialysis patients really is, is limited logarithmically to the remote rural north. Uh, unfortunately, where a lot of our indigenous patients receive uh, often poor access to care. We look at hemodialysis units in, say, Garden Hill or other places in northern Manitoba. We've done extensive costing studies. Those units are costing us $200,000 per patient per year to sustain them up in their home communities. About 1 in 10 Canadians, or pretty much in any westernized screening study in the world, have some form of chronic kidney disease. The leading causes of chronic kidney disease is no surprise to clinical people in the room are diabetes and high blood pressure. 
Um, and certainly, uh, these, uh, the presence of chronic kidney disease is independently associated with adverse outcomes, especially cardiovascular outcomes. And this is what I was alluding to before. This is some work we did with the Manitoba Center for Health Policy data set a few years ago showing really the growth in dialysis is pretty much exclusively related to the remote rural north. Other screening studies we've done suggest about one in three First Nations people have some form of chronic kidney disease. We can do better. And we are a very laboratory-based specialty, and Dr. Tangri in our lab a few years ago uh, basically validated the, the kidney failure risk equation, which uses a couple of simple laboratory parameters that are cheap and easily accessible, uh, a sample of urine showing urinary protein, a blood test showing estimated GFR, which is derived from creatinine, age and sex, and we can very accurately predict a two and five year risk of kidney failure in almost any patient at risk for chronic kidney disease. This is an important step forward which allows us to finally align resources with prevention with risk. So we treat high risk patients very aggressively, which are the minority of patients, and low risk patients very cautiously with a surveillance based approach. And this again starts lending itself much better to a public health solution for chronic kidney disease rather than the traditional primary care model. Shifting gears a bit here, this is just a costing study that our lab has published. It's extensively cited now, and again, consistent with costing studies really all over the world, suggesting that if you have bricks and mortar dialysis units, how again, most of the world de delivers dialysis, and patients are coming in three times a week for four hours, and we gotta pay for the bricks and mortar, the operating costs, the skilled human resources, the costs are significantly higher than patients doing dialysis at home, where we don't have those capital costs, which although the machine costs and the consumables costs are higher, um, we're certainly getting um, cheaper dialysis. And that cheaper dialysis, by the way, because we're delivering it more frequently and more gently, offers significantly better outcomes, closer to home, with better health-related quality of life. So again, um, Basically, what we want to accomplish with this solution is we have all this data in Manitoba. We know from billing data who's got high blood pressure, who's got type 2 diabetes, who's got cardiovascular disease. Those patients are at risk of developing chronic kidney disease or kidney failure. We have an equation that we have, have this lab data all in one place. We know who to run the equation on, and we can actually provide individual patients at a public health level the two and five year risk of their progression for chronic kidney disease. So we can feed back to primary care practitioners. Are your patients being appropriately screened? Are they on important medications or lifestyle considerations that uh, would prevent their progression to kidney failure? And by the way, if patients are at high risk of kidney failure in the next couple of years, we can provide comprehensive education to those patients early on about how they should be potentially on home dialysis or arranging home dialysis in their home communities, um, which, which certainly is something that's gonna drive value to the system. So the earlier we catch chronic kidney disease, the better we can manage patients with lifestyle, medications, and with certainly education around preparing for home dialysis. And that's really the main value factor here in, in, in this project. Um, we want to, when we have collaborated with a number of our patient partners, some of you are gonna hear uh, uh, from today, around the project like this, early inter intervention, better education, driving care closer to home, especially with our indigenous patients. And we're gonna be using some innovative clinical trial methodologies, which again, not your traditional randomized control trial or observational trial, but trials working with indigenous communities to bring care closer to home, where we can actually hire people within the community, healthcare aides and lay people within the community to help provide home dialysis at a much lower cost, employ people in the community, improve outcomes, and, and, and certainly study this so we can spread and scale it throughout the province and throughout other parts of the world. So thanks very much for your attention. We'll be answering questions later. Um, I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you. So it's uh, it's a it's uh, an honor to be able to uh, speak about uh, our component of this uh, of this uh, project. So um, so our study is called the Captain Study, um, and. It's something uh, that a, a large group of us have been working on, uh, especially Kathleen Decker, uh, who's in the audience, uh, did a lot of the uh, initial work around this and has continued to be a um, uh, major collaborator. So um, our project really starts uh, from the view of uh, a patient or a person, not yet a patient, someone who uh, is um, perhaps uh, going through some health concerns, isn't sure what's going on, they might uh, go to their family doctor uh, and, uh, and uh, 
you know, ask, you know, if there's something they should be worried about, if they need a test. Um, and it really starts from our perspective when the question of what's going on involves, is this a cancer uh, or is it not a cancer? And all of the cascade of things that, that needs to happen to sort that out. The patient may be too unwell. They may not have a family doctor. They may, uh, they may choose to go to an emergency room or a hospital and get, uh, and get checked out in uh, a much more high intensity um, uh, form of healthcare. And uh, that then drives their investigations and their future visits and, that, and, and, uh, and uh, in a much different way. Um, and in Manitoba, for many years now, we've had uh, a system of patient navigation where, uh, where patients uh, themselves, their family doctor, uh, or through the hospital, missing an error there, um, are able to um, connect them up with a nurse navigator uh, that, uh, that then can help to um, provide them with information about, uh, about maybe you know, what symptoms they're having, um, provide support to them and their family. Um, and, then, uh, and then what happens, whether they're on the navigation program or not, um, is they go on and before they see an oncologist like myself, they will go on to get a number of different tests. And these are just examples, uh, but you can see that often if it's a concern over, say, a colon cancer, they would get a colonoscopy. They would often get a CT scan, maybe multiple CT scans, certainly blood tests, many blood tests. Um, Often they need surgery, um, and so there's a whole you know, series of investigations and visits around that. Um, and, uh, and if they don't go for surgery, or sometimes even if they do, they, we need uh, additional biopsies of the lesions to sort out whether this is in fact a cancer or not. And, and now, especially uh, uh, nowadays, we need a lot of information from the tissue to help, to help uh, determine the appropriate treatment. And there's wait times in all of these. There's, uh, there's schedules uh, that have to be uh, coordinated. Um, and uh, you have to then wait for results. Um, and, uh, and so these all take time. When uh, a patient goes through that and they're on the navigation uh, service, um, these, uh, these points of contact are, are organized uh, in large part by the nurse navigator and entered into our electronic medical record uh, and treatment system called ARIA, which is the Varian product, and our partner in this project. The, um, so it, there is already a, some centralization for the patients that, uh, that uh, are navigated, but that is completely manual. So they get connected to a person, that person phones them, might phone the CT department, might phone the pathology lab to try to get the information and it's faxed information and they get it all very manually and they enter it into the system. And they do a lovely job, but it's very, uh, very demanding on time and uh, is not very efficient um, and uh, could be improved. Um, and the truth is, of course, these are all discrete contacts with the health system. These all uh, are then trackable and traceable and have electronic footprint that is connected in systems that we could have access to. And the proposal that we've put forward in the, the project really is trying to connect those systems using the data that we need to help support patients through, uh, through this process and getting on to treatment. And, um, and unfortunately, it doesn't look quite like this. It looks a little bit more like this, where people will go to the hospital, get a couple of CT scans. They might get a biopsy or a blood test. They then go, uh, they're well enough to get home. They go home. They might wait for a while. They might talk to their family doc. They might not. They go back for a CT scan because something was missed or something needed follow-up. Um, the, the pathway is not linear, and it's very difficult for then someone to try to help pull people through that process, and much harder, of course, if you're a patient and don't have that connection uh, to a navigator, you are essentially doing it on your own or letting the system organically get you through uh, the process. And that is high stress, uh, and that is uh, something that could be improved. So the CAPTAIN study uh, initiated years ago, quite a few years ago, uh, and at the time, and since then, we've engaged uh, patients uh, in, uh, in the process, uh, navigators, uh, oncologists, and, and other physicians. Uh, we've engaged our provincial partners, and as you know, with digital health and uh, shared health, um, and vendors um, to help us with what these solutions could look like. And uh, really, we, couldn't, we would not be here if we did not have that type of engagement. 
Um, and the real question was, couldn't we develop a single source for this information, or at least have all of those different sources populate a single source? Um, we really want this to be viewable, of course, by the navigator. That's really where this all started from, was giving more power to that navigator uh, so that it's less manual. They can intervene more. They can provide more direct patient contact or share more information um, and can do so more efficiently. Um, are we able to then, if they're managing this, are, is there an ability to reduce the number of CT scans or hospital visits, uh, very expensive contact with the healthcare system, um, and reduce time? And so those really are our questions for the study. However, that only goes so far. We obviously uh, need to empower patients. Um, and what we heard clearly from those partners was having access to their information would provide them with um, more autonomy, more ability, uh, less fear, less anxiety around what's happening. Um, and so providing patients with, an, with access to their schedule to know that they're on track, to know uh, what's coming up next is really critical for us. Um, and of course, physicians, so their family physician or the oncologist or others involved in their care would want to know potentially where they are on that, on that pathway to make sure that their timeframes are being met. Um, and I should say in the background, a lot of that initial work involved coming up with what those diagnostic and treatment pathways were for uh, the major cancers. And so we really have a lot of background information to fall back on for this. So the goal is to take this messy pathway uh, and harmonize it and provide those data sources to go into a single point of a single record. And so for us, what it means uh, at Cancer Care uh, and for our patients is, is bringing information from those disparate systems into our electronic system, uh, organizing it so that we know what the patient's schedule is. We can then calculate using uh, the, the, the software tools that we're gonna be provided and that we're working to build uh, with, our, with our partners in Varian. Um, so that it is organized in a way that patients and navigators and providers are able to uh, know when someone is at risk of taking too long to get a certain test and can actually intervene um, so that patients can know, uh, you know, what is coming up next. Um, and that's really what uh, the solution is that we are trying to provide by linking those data sets. Um, I don't want to gloss over it. There, the other icon that you see beside uh, the, the, the pink face uh, called Nuna is is, uh, is uh, a product that, uh, that uh, Varian has and is developing um, that has, uh, is patient facing and provides an ability for us to, uh, to share information with patients. So uh, obviously at first that's the type of schedule information that we're talking about uh, so that patients know where they are uh, on, that, uh, on, uh, on that trajectory and, and what's coming up next. But also, a lot of the information uh, that they need uh, is currently, uh, you know, shared in paper form or, uh, or over the phone um, and can be provided electronically for the patient or for their family members to, to view. And so if they're going down a pathway and we're pretty worried that this is lung cancer, but the oncologist needs a lot more detail than that, they can still be given information about lung cancer, what to expect. Um, and we're now starting to see ways where we can build future research questions around that so that uh, we know what information really does help people so that they uh, can be prepared for their uh, journey. And so we're building uh, already future collaborations around that. Um, and so the goal then really is to, is to provide that single system um, and uh, provide different views of that system. So the innovations that our, our study is meant to, uh, meant to bring are really around the integration of uh, these disparate systems that I've, that I've briefly touched on. Um, use the primary data to support the care differently uh, because these data are available right now and instead of calling and speaking to someone asking when so-and-so is booked for their CT scan, it can populate a system so that they can view it. Um, we've used an innovative trial design um, and so uh, our, my team can speak more eloquently than I about this, but essentially, um, rolling out this, this uh, solution in a, in a stepped approach allows us to really measure the advantages uh, or disadvantages of building a system in this way and integrating data and providing access in this way. And, and the truth uh, around that, uh, that, that um, uh, 
uh, study design is it allows us to then iterate and go back to improve the system in ways uh, that, will really, uh, that will really benefit uh, people most. Uh, we want to provide patient access, and that is something that we'll have a, a lot of uh, discussion around it to make sure that that is done in an appropriate and secure manner, but, but really putting access into patients' hands for uh, this aspect I think is critical. Um, and we really do find uh, that the, the partnerships that we're building um, are, uh, are really setting us in the right direction for future projects and allowing us to really think about health differently and, uh, and how we can innovate within health. And so there's a lot of future potential, uh, I think, with around uh, the way that we're using these data um, and uh, look forward to the project. And so thank you for listening to me today. That's all I want to say. Happy to answer questions later. I'd like to um, ask Brett to come up and speak about traction. Thank you. Okay. So I am perhaps not who you're expecting when you heard the name Brett, but it does provide me with a distinct microphone advantage here. <laughs> so we are going to be talking about the use of the data platform um, to facilitate into, um, more innovative clinical trial methodology. Beyond um, specific funding for uh, traction in my graduate studies, I don't have any other um, conflict, conflicts of interest to disclose. And so traction was designed because perioperative bleeding um, is the second most common cause for transfusion in patients who are admitted to hospital. As blood is an expensive um, and limited resource, our goal here is to evaluate whether or not the routine administration of this medication can reduce the need for transfusion in patients who are undergoing um, higher risk non-cardiac surgery. To do so, um, we've designed a large um, 8,000 patient a multi-center randomized trial. Um, it comprises a diverse patient population um, with a large representation from patients with malignancy um, who are at particularly increased risk for transfusion and perioperative complications around the time of their surgery. So clinical trials are required to inform best practice, um, and yet they're expensive and they're inefficient. And they're predicated on the use of research personnel um, who function entirely in parallel with the delivery um, of healthcare. And in doing so, um, there's a long time um, from trial inception to trial completion, um, and it causes an unnecessary delay in terms of our ability to answer key questions um, and to provide an improvement in quality care to patients. Another challenge um, with traditional um, randomized trial methodology um, relates to that of consent. Um, and so while it's imperative um, to respect the patient's autonomy um, with respect to their rights to choose to, to um, participate in research, um, over time there's been increasing regulation with respect to this. And paradoxically, um, patients actually know less or little um, about the specific trial methodology um, despite increasing, um, increasingly lengthy enrollment procedures. And so it's these infrastructure barriers that have created challenges or that have inhibited Manitoba from leading large clinical trials, um, although now um, with the advent of this integrated data set and mindset, um, times are changing and that's less likely to be a concern. So this is a crucial step towards the development of a learning health system, as Ryan had alluded to previously. Um, we already um, capture clinical data um, regularly with our patient encounters, but now we're able to readily utilize this patient data um, in a research capacity specifically. This substantially reduces the costs of clinical trials. So using traditional methodology, um, it's estimated that traction would cost somewhere in the realm of eight to $10 million to complete, also a number of years. Um, with the use of the integrated data platform, we estimate that we can complete this trial with a budget of somewhere around one and a half to two million dollars, so really quite a fraction of the original cost. It also means that more trials can be performed. It, in, it means that patients and investigative teams have more opportunity to participate in research, which really forwards us with the opportunity to answer these important questions that are meaningful and to impact patient care. Traction is really on the cutting edge of trial methodology, um, which has garnered international attention as of recent. Um, this trial was designed um, with input from our patient partners. 
to really shape a risk-adapted consent methodology that emphasizes patient-oriented outcomes rather than investigator-led priorities. Now, Mindset provides the infrastructure to electronically identify the patients throughout the duration of our trial, but also um, to capture our outcomes without the need for a manual um, research coordinator. And that this is really um, the key element that um, reduces the cost to only a fraction of what they otherwise would be. Now, this new trial design is new in Manitoba and, quite frankly, in Canada and beyond as well. Um, but by challenging ourselves to push the envelope with these methods, um, these can be translated to future studies um, in our Manitoba population. So Mindset and Traction have provided numerous opportunities to build capacity, particularly with respect to data integration and the analysis of complex data. It's also provided a unique opportunity um, for the next generation of clinician scientists um, and will enable and facilitate the recruitment and retention of su successful clinicians, but also successful clinician scientists and investigators. So we expect that Traction will improve patient outcomes and forward a new standard of care with respect to perioperative medicine. We plan to foster sustainability by both preserving Canada's blood supply, but by also reducing overall cost. So with the routine administration of this medication, um, which is really quite inexpensive in and of itself, we anticipate that this will work out to approximately a $600,000 in cost savings on an annual basis, and that's just in Manitoba alone. Of equal importance, uh, Mindset's laying the foundation, um, which is needed to create the learning health system. And a natural extension of this premise, which is the integration of the delivery of healthcare with research conduct, um, is really um, the comparative, comparative effectiveness trials. So every day um, on the ward, when we see a patient, um, there's numerous questions that come about. Someone's admitted with pneumonia. Should we treat them with antibiotic A or should we treat them with antibiotic B? Should they be treated with 10 days or should they be treated for seven days? And historically, we haven't been able to answer this this question, using traditional methodology, would cost $5 million in five years, and so it's not practical or feasible in order to ask these types of questions. And yet, now with mindset, um, addressing these knowledge gaps could really become a reality. So I have to thank a lot of funding sources and team members. And um, I think, is it Ryan? Perhaps, I'm done. <laughs> Somebody else come up here. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. We've got a, a time for a couple of questions, and then we'll have a bit longer at the end for questions than we budgeted, so that'll be fine. So anybody have any questions for, uh, for the panelists? And I would just say that um, uh, if you're asking a question, just perhaps introduce yourself. And, uh, and for those joining remotely, as was talked about earlier, we will be taking online and text questions from Poll Everywhere, and the instructions are on the screen and on the front of the program. Yes, sir. Yeah, Alan Garland from the Department of Medicine. My question is, um, I think will involve answers from Ryan and possibly Peter Nickerson and Alan Katz if he's here as well. So the this is a real-time or almost real-time data platform and a lot of the uh, electronic systems can feed into it and it'll be awesome. But there are some, there's a lot of data around that, um, that does not come from those systems but is incredibly useful, um, has been used historically and, um, and integrating them with this platform sounds like a, a really good thing. So Peter, uh, as Peter knows, he set up a, a working group within the university to look at, um, at trying to uh, um, uh, set up a common um, uh, platform for the various different, if you want to call them research level data sets that, uh, that faculty members have, there's probably, there's many dozens of them, maybe even more than, maybe even hundreds. Um, is there any thought or plan of how to integrate those into Mindset? And also the administrative data that is at the Center for Health Policy, a lot of that data is not real-time data, but in integrating it with the things that are real-time will make it incredibly, even more useful than what you already project. So are there thoughts about if and how to do those, uh, how to integrate those into one massive super data set um, for, that will be useful for clinical and research and policy purposes? That's my question. Who wants to take that? So, oh, Brian? Thank you, Alan. I don't know. 
Check one. Yes, I have a microphone now. Thank you, Alan, for that question. Um, yeah, for sure, we're not the only group, Paul and Marshall and myself and the government in Manitoba to think about how to use data. And Peter is running, uh, leading a complex data strategy within the university. And Alan Katz and the MCHP folk are really vital to this conversation. We are approaching our use of data different ways for different reasons. We will develop a, a playing field um, together that allows us to play to our strengths, MCHP administrative data, complex data, uh, omics, storage, analytics, and mindset real-time clinical data for decision making together in a way that allows all, all, all three partners uh, to be at the table well represented, serving different functions, uh, overlapping where we need to, and separating and playing to our strengths when appropriate. Absolutely. Okay. okay, I think at this point uh, we'll bring our panelists on and we're going to bring the P, uh, principal investigators back to have a joint Q&A uh, just a little bit later, but we'll hear briefly from the panelists. So if I could ask the uh, panelists to come onto the stage. And um, while you're coming on, um, I'll, uh, I'll introduce you. These, these individuals on the panel are, are key knowledge users. Uh, who obviously see a real opportunity with mindset. So uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion and then we'll throw it open for question and answers. Uh, Kathy Woods, if you, Kathy, you wanna raise your hand? <laughs> Kathy Woods is a patient partner, so one of our patient partners in the, in the CanSolve Chronic Kidney Disease Network, as well as co-chair of CanSolve's Indigenous Peoples Engagement and Research Council. I think we've got a slide. Pardon me? Two slides. Right there? Oh no, backwards. Okay. And, um, and then we have Alex Singer. Alex, if you could raise your hand. Um, Alex uh, is, a is a Winnipeg family physician and an associate professor of medicine in the University of Manitoba. And then we have um, uh, Dan Sk uh, Skorchuk. Dan, if you can raise your hand there. Uh, Dan is the assistant deputy minister and chief financial officer with Manitoba Health seniors and active living. We have Peter Nickerson, who spoke earlier, and as you know, is the Vice Dean Research of the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And, and we have Tracy McConaughey, uh, who is the uh, president of the Bioscience Association of Manitoba, an organization that promotes the growth of the bioscience industry in Manitoba. So those are our uh, panelists. and. Uh, We'll start with our most important, the patient voice. <laughs> and so I want to turn to Kathy first, and, um, and we'll just pass you the mic, Kathy. Uh, so obviously we're taught, we've heard today about mindset and, and the integrated data platform, and really just want you to comment, if you could, on, on, on do you think that moving in this direction will result in better care and improved health outcomes for Manitoba? And do you think it'll be an opportunity or be an important tool to reduce health inequities, particularly for Indigenous peoples, but also under other underserved populations as well? Well, to answer the, the first part of the question about whether it will provide um, better health care, um, as, as a patient partner um, on a, um, a kidney research uh, project, to be able to have access to, to more information for people. But I also think that you really have to look at uh, in terms of um, the permission granted and all of those things that people understand what their information is going to be used for. And I think if people understand what their information is going to be used for, then they'll, they'll be um, more likely to participate and be part of it and to know that it's a good thing. Um, and from my perspective, speaking as someone who um, was diagnosed early with kidney disease. Um, to be able to, to have those things uh, done in a timely manner, I think is really important for people and that's something that they really um, have, to, have to look at. The other part of the question about um, the inequities for um, us as Indigenous people within the healthcare system, I think that, that in, in, um, in reality it has a long way to go. I think that we're we're there. I like the idea of the partnerships about developing the platforms and developing them together, because um, you know, as we know about kidney disease, that it, it affects uh, um, indigenous communities um, to a, a greater extent than non-indigenous communities, and that you have to look at having um, 
having access to that information, but also having um, partnerships, partnerships with Angosmin, partnerships with First Nations, uh, um, I always get it wrong, First Nations, Finism, I call it, mm -hmm. um, Social Secretariat of Manitoba, and have, have partnerships with them to be able to share that information and for everyone to understand what that information is going to be used for. And I think if, if uh, us as patients understand that that information will lead to better service delivery and better care for us as patients, I think that, that uh, the consent and everything, and you know, everybody's always concerned about what's going to happen to their information. It's out there sitting on some cloud somewhere, having a good time, and who's going to access yeah. it, and what's going to happen to it. And I, I think if you involve your patients more in your, in your studies, and you involve your patients, not just in, 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 um, in, um, as patient advisory. I think patient advisory committees are great. But I also think that there's a lot more that patients can do to, to, to be involved in projects, in determining um, the questions, the research questions, all of those things. Um, um, I'm heavily involved in our kidney check project. Um, attend a lot more meetings than I'd like to, but uh, it's really, really helpful for me as a patient to understand where my information's going and what's gonna happen to it. Um, and we need to provide that information for folks. Excellent, excellent. So, um, Alex, just building on Kathy's patient perspective and reflecting on your own practice, can you, can you comment at all on um, what some of the challenges are with the, with the current access to data that you have? Does it, does it contribute to any gaps in care or frustrations? And how would moving in this direction with mindset potentially create um, a, a better opportunity for providers as well? So I think it was said earlier in some of the, <coughs> the, the discussions around the fact that our, da our data right now is, is mostly siloed. And so it doesn't operate the way that the sort of rest of the world of our data exists. With <coughs> so I, I and probably most people in this room carry around a supercomputer in our pockets, um, which is far more powerful than you know, most of the computers we would have used 10, even 15 years, yeah, 15 years ago easily. Um, whereas when I go to my office, I operate what I sometimes refer to as an electronic paper record. It, it is a computer, but all of the processes are essentially paper processes. I print prescriptions, I print lab recs, patients take those pieces of paper off to some other provider, a pharmacist, a lab, and then their care is conducted and the, and the data is re-entered into a whole new silo. Um, and so the barrier becomes, as a clinician, when I'm trying to look across those systems, if I want to understand did a patient take their medication, for example, I have to then pull up a different system and have a look and kind of do some math in my head, which I'm terrible at, despite the fact that I use databases for research. And then I have to say, well, maybe they did take the medication, whereas I, I, can't, actually, I can't actually measure at aggregate in any way, uh, nor can we look at it at the system level. And the same is true with scheduling and requisitioning and all of these things where each each system, so as a clinician, each system stands alone. I can't tell the patient when their CT scan is booked because I don't, I don't have access to that information. And wouldn't it be great if, as the patient was walking out the room or walking out the clinic, they could go ahead and book their, their scan or their, or their appointment at the, lab, at the lab or have their prescription delivered to their house just because I had prescribed it, which are not terribly fantastical. All those things exist in other industries, right? That's how you fly a plane, access your banking, order books. So I think we can get there, uh, and I think the technology exists, and this is a first step to bring healthcare into that kind of technological capacity so that as a clinician, I can access those services. As a patient, those services can be accessed and viewable in real time, and they can actually see when their appointment is booked on their cell phone. I mean, I, I know that I'm flying on Saturday, and I know exactly when I'm flying, and I know that if the flight's delayed, I'm gonna get an email. That doesn't happen with CT scans or my visits or many other things in the healthcare system. So I think we're moving in that direction and that's exciting and I think we can get there because this is, while it's innovative in healthcare, it's actually not terribly innovative in other industries, but I, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> that's excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So Dan, um, Dan Ryan's often identified you as a kind of a major, a major uh, Dan, uh, Ryan's identified you in the past as a, as a major supporter and sort of driver of this whole initiative. You've heard from Alex uh, some of the struggles that clinicians have with our current system and the opportunities this opens up for healthcare providers. W what about kind of decision makers and, and folks at your level in, 
in the broader healthcare system that are trying to look for efficiencies and manage? Are there opportunities that you see here? Yeah, thanks, Brock. I, absolutely. I think there's uh, tremendous opportunities that will present uh, through this and other related work in the realm of information management and analytics. And um, I mean, most notably, um, these efforts are ultimately going to better inform decision makers at large, clinicians, researchers, folks in surveillance roles, uh, administrators, policymakers, uh, any number of uh, patients, clients, residents, any, any number of individuals who at the end of the day are fundamentally going to make care better in Manitoba for our patients, clients, and residents. So it's hard not to get behind uh, any, an initiative such as this that, that fundamentally is going to uh, move the needle in that direction. But certainly speaking specifically from the department's perspective and some of the role that we play, I, I can definitely see um, the efforts and the systems at hand uh, in terms of better informing uh, policy development in the realm of the department. I can potentially see um, the work helping to inform how we plan better. Brock, you mentioned earlier the, the, the new Provincial Clinical and Preventative Services Plan and helping to inform uh, some of that work provincially in terms of the types of services we offer, where we offer them, and how we fundamentally deliver them. So I can see definitely strides in that perspective. Uh, wearing the CFO hat for the department, I could see a lot of this work potentially informing how we commission and how we fund things in the healthcare system and how we look at that in a more innovative way, how we modernize how we fund programs and services in Manitoba to incent uh, the right uh, types of outcomes that we all want as um, not just administrators and decision makers, but al also users of the system at large. Um, as well, um, I would also add an oversight in terms of how we oversee the healthcare system uh, as the department and uh, looking towards, again, more integrated data sets, uh, looking at data in more real time, I think is going to allow us to effectively oversee the system in a much more better light, uh, not just at um, individual levels, but organizational levels and provincial levels as well. So I think there's lots of opportunity and the sky's the limit. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Peter, uh, you've been you've provided really tremendous leadership in the last number of years, not only within the university but within the broader healthcare system, trying to bring all the various players together, you know, to advance research generally in Manitoba, not just you know strictly speaking university based, although most of the research that's done does involve individuals with a university appointment. But so, with regard to mindset and where we're wanting to go, what 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 will that do for our research capacity, not only in the, in the university, but our, our ability to do research generally in Manitoba? Yeah, thanks, Brock. I, I think, you know, the the Faculty of uh, Health Sciences is actually a uniquely placed because we are fully integrated in the healthcare system. So we're not siloed in the university, but in fact, as you've heard from the clinician scientists today. The, the faculty themselves are embedded in the service delivery of healthcare. Uh, they have questions that are coming up constantly, and they need data to answer those questions. It's really, I think Ryan said it earlier on, it's about the learning health system. And I think that's what we're all talking about today at every level, patient, uh, administrator, uh, policymaker. How do we learn and evolve our system to deliver ultimately better patient care in the most effective way possible so that we actually have uh, with the limited resource, the most impact. Uh, so I, I see the mindset as really being a critical element of the real-time data, bringing it together to inform all of the things we've just been talking about. Our researchers need that type of data to, to, to work off of, to really do quality improvement, if, if nothing else. Um, and then to answer Alan Garland's question earlier, I mean, we have immense uh, depth of data that goes back into the 60s uh, with the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy. So linking and integrating data systems that are both real-time and longitudinal, we can actually understand how when we change policy, we can model out and simulate how that's going to impact um, outcomes in the long run. And then we can check our ideas into the future when we cha change something today, five years from now using our longitudinal data sets, did that make the impact that we thought we were going to have? So those are two major elements, but the bigger thing I would say is we need a workforce to do this. And one of the major focuses of the university is to train uh, and to train the next generation. And when we, when we heard um, about the uh, e-health system and really the analytic systems you're looking at building, you need trained individuals to do that. And what our mission is really to provide that level of uh, training. So we've been recruiting around our complex data strategy uh, leaders in data. Uh, we've had three Canada research chairs, one in 
um, artificial intelligence, <laughs> one in uh, data curation, uh, one in informatics. And by building these types of training environments, uh, we will have the workforce to m deliver on the research and the quality improvement and the system development that you want to have. Um, and within that training environment, if we don't have data platforms like Mindset, we can't train our, our future students. So I see it as really a symbiosis between both the university environment and the health system, and we'll all win together with this type of a platform going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. And Tracy, a lot of um, a lot of healthcare services, many healthcare services, of course, and uh, much of research is, um, or a lot of research is funded through public funds, and we all know where public funds come from. So I think we all have a real interest in trying to stimulate economic growth, particularly in Manitoba. Uh, and one area of opportunity is the bioscience industries that you represent. So in your view, how does this initiative, will this initiative uh, support in any way further partnerships between industry and, um, and the broader healthcare system to advance economic growth? Yeah, so we see quite a few points of intersection. We view the industry as individuals who perhaps have an affiliation with the universities who see an opportunity, see a need, and have want to create that and start their own business. We have other entrepreneurs who maybe came from another sector, say aerospace, and are creating their own companies. And then we have larger existing corporations from across Canada and around the world who, who want to intersect. So there's <coughs> benefits for all three of those. In, in that startup level, there are those who maybe have an idea or a concept, and the work that's gonna come through Mindset will help to validate and answer those questions. How significant of a problem is this? What is the opportunity? What is the impact that I can have on patients? What is the impact I can have on savings in the healthcare system? Trying to move away from just building cool things to building cool things that are relevant, because that's what we need now, and that's where we're seeing the support for research dollars going to as well research and commercialization. The other economic opportunity for Manitoba is with some of the larger organizations who have existing products, technologies, therapeutics, who need to assess and evaluate where those products are and what is the real world use of it. You referred to, is that patient taking their medication? Are they using their device correctly? We make investments on these products, but are we getting the desired outcomes? And if not, why? How could we use the data that we're gonna be able to pull to actually measure that? And in order to do that work, those companies will invest in our researchers. And those researchers will stay with the university. They may become their own companies again. So it's a real multiplier effect. There are many new economic opportunities. There are the training opportunities that Peter spoke about. But we're gonna see spin-offs from this down the road. Okay, thank you very much. I think at this point I'd like to invite the three PIs to come up and join the panel. No, you, you, you folks stay there. <laughs> and we'll get the three PIs. And um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to open it up again to uh, people in the room to ask questions, but uh, also uh, uh, people online uh, to send us your questions as well. So just while people are, are contemplating coming up to the mic, um, I wanted to ask um, uh, about uh, concerns that patients might have about privacy and, uh, and the security of the database. And uh, Kathy, maybe I could start with you, and Tracy, you may have some thoughts on this too, but uh, Kathy? Sure. Oh, you get two mics. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think that if you, in, in terms of things, if you explain things to people in, in plain language and, you know, maybe have a frequently asked questions, and, and I think if people really understand what their information is um, going to be used for, then they're going to be a lot more, um, a lot more, um, I'll let them leave. <laughs> <laughs> The um, people are going to be a lot more um, understanding of what their information is going to be used for. And I, I think that we, we really also need to understand that, you know, within, even within Manitoba, you know, we talked about inequalities and that we must understand there, there are a lot of First Nations and, and that, that don't have Wi-Fi access, that don't have those things. So we really need to understand how we're going to serve those populations. I just spent last week um, up at a reserve um, about three hours away. and. 
on the way there, we, we kept losing service. While we were there, we had no service. It was very spotty. And so, you know, you need to understand that and, and um, about um, um, Manitoba. But the other thing I wanted to say, you know, we talk a lot about data sets. We talk a lot about all of these things. But one of the things that you have to understand is that those data sets, not, those are people. Those are real people with real problems. You know, and so I think that we always must keep that in mind all the time, and that's why I think it's so important that we have patience on every different aspect of your committee and your working group as we move forward. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that, 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 that certainly provides um, kind of re some reassurance, I think, for patients. Uh, Tracy, sometimes when people hear about industry partnering with the healthcare system and doing research, they get kind of nervous about you know, our industry going to have access to patient data and information. What would be your response to that? So it's sort of a twofold answer. One is I think it's important to make sure that we inform and that patients understand that what's the intersection is industry is asking a question. And the researchers, the stewards that are up here today, are the ones who are doing the work. And there's a distinction there. I use, if I can, a, a fairly simple analogy is, it's like when you go to a restaurant and you request a bottle of wine. You request a bottle of Merlot. And you don't know all the pieces, all the grapes that go into it. And if you think of each of those patients as a little piece of that grape, they contain things that contribute to the data set. The different factors that they've been exposed to may change the flavor, the taste, and the dynamic. But when you ask for that bottle, you get a bottle of Merlot. Some people will be more sophisticated. They can ask for a certain region or a certain year. But what is outputted is a bottle, not the individual grapes. And you can never pull out the grapes out of that data set. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Just one, I just want to add one quick thought around data privacy is that you have to remember in, it, privacy is the right to be left alone. And when you enter into the healthcare system, you're willingly giving up information to providers who are going to help to try to make you better or improve your life. So what we owe, the duty that we owe to patients as providers is data protection, that we will use the information that they give us appropriately, that if we use it for research or for clinical care, it will be shared appropriately. We, we, we willingly tell people, I'm going to send a referral to another provider. I'm I'm not, they're not private anymore. Now another doctor knows about their whole life story and their care issues. So what we owe the patients and the population is data protection. And that's a really important principle. Whereas privacy sometimes muddies up the water and, and doesn't allow us to think about how do we protect the data properly? How do we ensure that it's used properly and that it's used properly all the time and we make sure that that's happening consistently? and get away from this idea that everything has to be you know, private, because it's not. When you enter into the healthcare system, you've willingly given that right up, and we shouldn't be sharing the information unwillingly, but we do, we do also have to use it in order to have a healthcare system that functions both clinically and to be a learning system. Great, thank you. We've got uh, a question online, then I'll come to you, and then we've got a couple more questions online. Uh, Ryan, one of the questions that's uh, coming from online is, um, and just briefly, what's your sense of when when other pro <coughs> excuse me when other projects might be entertained, and and I think one particular interest was when the um, if and when the immunization registry from the public health information management system might be included in this in this platform, um, because the questioner has some interest in uh, being able to follow the immuno immunocompromised clients and have the ability to determine whether they've had. <coughs> immunizations and if not be able to respond to that so just a general sense as to when you think we'll go beyond these three projects right I mean, the last comment about immunization is uh, really incredible um, I mean you probably know when your dog needs to be immunized next more than when you do um, to, and we just don't have a system that provides that information in real time to keep people up to date on vaccinations or what's due next uh, in general with regard to screening uh, screening for um, emerging pathogens, which is really in the news right now, screening for chronic disease surveillance, um, uh, incidents and outcomes are something that would be easily incorporated into mindset as this thing grows. Um, so I'm really excited by that. And Paul's project really speaks to that very much. When will we entertain next uh, next phase projects? Well, the, the, um, the, the 
the, this grant is four years. Um, we're not um, stopping uh, um, our ability. To, there's no there's no reason why we can't build well these projects underway. The 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 um, the the first first part of the database was around these three uh, trials to demonstrate to us as a as a community of, st of stakeholders, including patients, government, policymakers, that this is worth doing, that we can do this, and what have we learned by going down this road? Um, Dan, Dan um, Skorchuk uh, is responsible for a lot of important spending, and he wants to know that this thing is worth spending on. And so he's a really measured individual, and he's challenged us to be very precise on what we're doing so he can understand that future investments will be a value. And I mean, it's something that I've really learned by working with you, Dan. And so well, I think that we'll, sure, we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring other projects in um, if they come with funding, if they have obvious value, if they're a priority to the government. But then I think a lot of the growth will come after the first phase projects have been completed. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Um, I think that when... Maybe just introduce yourself, too. Okay, I'm Saul. I'm a research assistant in the Department oh, of Surgery. Okay. And so I'm interested in uh, harnessing data and presenting it to people, and I think it has the potential to change both systems and patient behavior. Um, for the systems, the aggregated data that they'll see, and for the patient, the individual data. And so I'm interested in, in what changes you guys think might happen, and then maybe more particularly in the CAPTAIN study, um, there's the question of uh, what will the patient see and what will the uh, care provider see, um, and how will that um, individualized information be presented to the patients? Um, so if anyone wants to comment on uh, those Marshall, topics, do you want to comment thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe grab another sure. mic. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I guess, um, you know, our, uh, the idea around this study is really to present patients uh, and providers with relatively simple information uh, around schedule, for example, so that they know uh, when their next appointment is and what's coming up. And, uh, and, and just even just to provide that level of information, I think, is going to be um, a, a really big advance. Um, the, you know where this could go, though, is really limitless. Um, the um, the the way that the way that we see this is, uh, I guess, once you've been able to uh, demonstrate value in uh, you know in showing patients information or providers information from these disparate systems, um, then you can start to build on other components that uh, would drive further value. So I, I mentioned uh, you know maybe briefly, but information sharing, for example, I think is, is uh, something that uh, as care providers we do well at the bedside, uh, but we do not do well in following up or in um, giving people something that they can refer to, share, discuss with family. Um, and, and I think providing them with those resources is a, is a potentially really big advantage. Uh, and so that is definitely one of the uh, components that we want to deliver as well, is the ability to, uh, to share information that we decide that we know uh, is safe and, and is uh, real and tangible and beneficial for them. Um, and so that's you know, even built into this project. Uh, where could it go? I think it's hard to even say, to be honest. Um, I think that depends on, um, um, on a lot of different factors, you know, what, what uh, patients would value, what providers would value. Um, and, uh, and of course, you'd have to consider some of the things that if we're providing results, for example, to patients directly, how that impacts them without context from their care providers. And um, those sorts of things have been uh, already um, tackled in other jurisdictions. But I think, um, you know, uh, there would be um, uh, reasons to, to, uh, to uh, have a careful look at that if anything was done uh, in Manitoba that way. Great, we got a number of questions coming in now, so um, just ask you to comment briefly. Uh, Marshall, while you've got the mic, um, there is a question around, uh, have you considered incorporating PREMS, you know, patient reported experience measures, uh, into your study to understand the patient experience? 
Thank you. Yes. Uh, so that's an excellent question and a point that I really actually wanted to highlight but didn't. These. Uh, so the. Um, one of our main outcome measures is to uh, is to know if uh, the change we've made has had a positive impact for patients. So you won't do that without being able to uh, measure. So you'd have to ask you know patients uh, about the experience, uh, about the care they provided, and then compare it to those that don't have that intervention. That's really what uh, one of our goals is. Um, I think the bigger point, uh, of course, is if there is a patient facing. Um, software that uh, that you're already providing schedule information, for example, or other information to, uh, then building in these questionnaires actually is really a is really a strength of of uh, the current version of the Nuna software that that uh, is going to support this. And so, for us, being able to um, actually pull out patient reported outcomes, patient reported experiences. Um, is really uh, a key part of what we're doing, and and uh, we want to uh, we want to actually be able to showcase that as uh, one strength of uh, of this type of work. Great, thank you. And having talked about PREMS, we also had a question, Paul, about um, PROMS, patient um, reported outcome measures, and wondering if you had thought about including those in your study to understand the differences in quality of life and symptoms between home and in-center dialysis patients. Yeah, so that data is fairly available currently um, that, you know, and, and we certainly want to incorporate more of that patient-related feedback as part of a living system. So including that in terms of a, a place within these data sets that we can record that and see how um, patient outcome measures shift as we shift the modality mix of uh, patients being more often at home or certainly closer to home. Um, you know, just, just as an aside, you know, looking at our kind of remote rural north um, epidemic of chronic kidney disease, um, there's been some studies out of northern Alberta suggesting that if patients could reside in their home community on a reserve versus moving to Edmonton, they would be willing to give up five years of life in an already very limited lifespan. So really that, that closer to home factor is so important, especially for our, our vulnerable indigenous patients in the north. But I think as we start shifting that modality mix from you know people having to come to Winnipeg to receive dialysis in a center to providing care closer to home with an assistant and so on, um, how their experiences and outcome measures are uh, you know shifting, I think is a really important metric to uh, for us to collect. Great, thank you. Um, Ryan, somebody mentioned, I can't recall who, um, non-methods of consent as being a component of mindset. Can you elaborate on what that means? Um, probably novel methods of consent. Oh, okay, novel, that's, yeah. I didn't, okay that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, no. yeah non-methods <laughs> non didn't, so we, that's why I couldn't remember yeah. it. We won't mention the non-methods. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the problems and problems question is a really great comment. If I just come back for one second, is that the mindset platform is meant to demonstrate within our trials that it, that the routine incorporation of problems and problems to some degree can be done and should be used in, 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 as a routine function within our Manitoba health system. And Sarah Kirby and Eric Bohm was sitting over there are leading that uh, pr uh, pr provincial initiative. And so that's part of the spin-offs of mindset. Novel methods of consent, great. That's one aspect of Brett's trial that she mentioned about um, traditionally we've used one model of consent since 1940s or 50s for all research projects uh, despite innovations in medicine changes in health in general, but this, stag this, this sort of stagnant, unwavering, non, um, non very uninnovative uh, way to... Uh, to provide uh, protect patients autonomous autonomy and and um, and have them be willing participants of research but it, it's also not the appropriate method each time it's not risk adapted it does not consider whether a drug is experimental or routine use whether this is totally an unknown field with uh, with unknown risk versus known risks, and so there are many models of consent now that are that are that are different than the original model we, we brought in and continue to use as a workhorse. And each of the projects that we hear, you heard now have different methods of consent that are adapted to the trial in general. And so um, that's a different discussion. We had a forum on earlier in the year. Uh, suffice to say that the the, the novel uh, data platform creates opportunities for not only innovative clinical trials, but innovative consent models. So we have lots of questions. I'll just take one from you. Sorry. You have to stand up there to reach this. Um, Melody Maswag, and I'm with Ongomas and Health Services. 
Um, my question is around um, the has the federal government been involved in any of the um, work that's being done? Because from an indigenous point of view, um, a lot of the data that's held is held with FINIB. And even trying to implement EMRs in our communities that would link to the regional health authorities in which those communities are located, we run into issues around um, that the federal government will not allow our EMRs to be linked because they feel that or uh, that Manitoba Health um, doesn't meet the standards for that the federal government holds to transfer that data or to share that data. So we have a lot of data that's sitting in community or at, at the federal level um, that's really important that we can't capture and really doesn't inform um, what's really going on in community and the gaps. And, and you talk about the gaps and wanting to address those and we know that's a huge area. So how can we work to be in a system that is for everybody? It's not just for people that don't live on reserve. Sure. And that's a concern for me. Yeah, Thanks. no, that's an excellent question. Before I ask the panelists, I understand that uh, Rai Morin is in the audience. Is that true? Oh, right there. Sorry, I didn't see you're off to the side. And Rai, you're the director of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, just wondering if you had any comments on that and, and, and more generally about mindset and how it might help advance our efforts to address the issues related to truth and reconciliation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, this one does work. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think it's a really perfect segue from uh, the last commentator's um, observations here. And I'll just provide a little bit of context for why I might make some comments here. The country itself was challenged with uh, embracing an overall national healing process as a result of uh, the long-standing human rights violations that Canada had undertaken in the um, Indian residential school system. And very similar to this initiative, there was a recognition that we had to assemble a record that would allow us to best understand what happened. And that entailed a, a massive data collection effort uh, where we secured records from various church archives and government departments and archives and brought those together at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which is, of course, located um, down on the Fort Garry campus. Um, we, in doing that, had to surmount a number of particular challenges, including uh, the transfer of records that had traditionally, be held, uh, traditionally been held under a federal regime to a provincial regime, and that required the development of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation Act. Um, which now applies to the collection of records that we have. Without a doubt, what that amassing of information permitted was an understanding of what happened and what needs to happen that had not before been possible because the data had been isolated and segregated and chopped up. And it was actually the bringing together of the written data and the oral history of essentially people that had experienced it in this context, it might be patients, to really provide us with the window that we needed. Now, where I think something like this is really important is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission itself was tasked with figuring out A, what happened, and B, what the legacy of the system is. It wasn't able to deal with the forward-looking work other than providing a series of calls to action to the Canadian public on, on how things needed to change. And with certainty, a huge part of those calls to action focused on, uh, I'd say, three main pillars. Uh, an overall responsibility for Canada to uh, address and rectify the gross inequalities that continue to persist in our healthcare uh, system and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the health of Indigenous peoples. Uh, B, uh, a far greater transparency over what those inequalities are. And then C, uh, accountability mechanisms to actually ensure that things are changing. Specifically, 
As a country, we've been asked to report annually on whether or not the gaps that exist are closing or widening. And we still continue to operate without that level of transparency at a national, provincial, uh, local, regional level. And that reflects an overall lack of uh, ability to really understand whether or not the efforts that we're undertaking to heal and to rectify are working or not. So in a, in a system like this, um, in, um, in amassing information, there has to be, I think, a, a real effort to ensure we're reporting out, educating the public, providing communities, providing uh, public policymakers with the real-time information that we need, and that really is called upon on an on a annual basis. Um, and we know from past experience, you know, uh, that assembling data in novel ways uh, yields insights that are of paramount importance to uh, creating a, a better, more just, uh, more equitable, uh, fair society for everybody to ensure that nobody's getting left behind. So, Excellent. Okay, thank you. Just want to, uh, just one last question before we stop, and Dan, I'm going to direct it to you. There's a few questions that I'll combine into one. Um, one question that's come up is, is sort of who owns the, 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 the platform or mindset. I think it's fair to say, Dan, that the platform, the data, will, will reside in Manitoba Health, right? In the, in the provincial um, information management and analytics. And then another question is, we've talked today about how these three research projects will kind of drive the initial priorities around what data to bring into the platform. But the qu two questions, um, is it only formal research projects that will be able to drive what goes in to building the platform, or will there be other opportunities to add data for other reasons? Mm -hmm. And the other question and related question is, how, do you, how will people be able to access this platform? Will, will you be going through analysts to get at the platform, to get at the data in the platform? In other words, how, uh, how accessible will it be to people in the system who want to who wanna mine it? Right. Well, I guess to the first question, I mean, the, the, the provincial information management and analytics um, functionality is being designed and developed in a way that it is adaptable. Uh, we'll have the ability and capability of taking on uh, ad additional sets of data and uh, potentially making those available to any number of decision makers, as I mentioned earlier, that would include but would not be limited uh, to just researchers. Um, I, I guess um, for us and for the department and for Pima, part of the value proposition of this really important partnership is to help inform things like governance, uh, as you saw on one of the slides, or a couple of the slides, governance, um, access, privacy-related considerations in the realm of research, and um, how we can effectively renew some of our approaches uh, to some of those elements in, 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 in new ways and in a more provincially-oriented way. So you are going to see um, great great strides taken on behalf of the service, the shared service, to be able to work with uh, any number of constituencies, again, including but not just limited to researchers. And frankly, the access as aspects are still components that we have yet to design and develop um, with folks um, on the stage here uh, this afternoon. Great. And is Christina in the audience? Christina Weiss? Christina, could you just uh, very briefly, because we only have a minute or two, um, just uh, comment on um, what opportunities you see for potential partnerships between Research Manitoba and Mindset to perhaps uh, look at uh, supporting other research projects that could help grow the platform. And I think this um, goes to Tracy's point. Um, one thing I would say is that for probably the past 15 years, when we've been talking to researchers or even companies um, about the opportunities of data in Manitoba, there's been a lot of excitement, right? In Manitoba, as compared to many other provinces, obviously you know through the center and, and um, other clinical data, we've had a wealth of it, but we haven't really been able to um, leverage and, and take advantage of that opportunity. And I think through a partnership, a strategic partnership opportunity that we're building, um, within Research Manitoba, we are going to be able to help leverage that and, and use the platforms um, that, that, that are existing at the Manitoba Centre and then with Mindset as it's developed. Um, we are working through some of the governance 
around working with industry because you're right, we don't want industry to have access mm -hmm. to patient information, but there are ways to have industry, as Tracy said, ask the questions, and then there is a governance about how you access it and, and then how that information is actually provided to industry and what they use. But I think that there is a lot of opportunity for investments into research in Manitoba within that kind of a framework. Again, we've been talking to, to companies for years, and now it feels that, that the door is open for Excellent. us. Excellent. So on it. that very positive note, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll wind this up. I, I, I think I uh, won't belabor it. I think you appreciate now the opportunity and the importance of this initiative and how it will fundamentally, I think, uh, uh, change, certainly change the way we access data and we're able to use data. And, and it's an absolutely critical component of moving forward with health services, uh, redesign and delivery and research and evaluation and all the rest of it. So it's a critical link. Thank you for your time today. I do want to, just before you go, I really want to thank all the speakers uh, who represented um, some of our key partners who have come together to make sure that this platform is a success. I want to thank uh, Gary Annabelle for his role in organizing today's forum and the many others who contributed to today. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, CIHR and the Manitoba government for their financial support. And again, thank all of the partners, particularly the patients who have provided input along the way uh, for their ongoing commitment. And finally, thank all of you for joining us. And the last thing is, please remember to fill out your evaluation forms. Thank you very much.